Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Lawrence Bros. I am the uh, Associate Director uh, for the Center of Commerce and Diplomacy at UC San Diego. I'm also a professor of political science. Um, I'm really excited about this event because it is right in the wheelhouse of the center. We, our, our mission is guided by the principle that um, trade and economic cooperation more generally are crucial to uh, ensuring prosperity and peace. And um, we have as a topic today, um, the GATT WTO and its future. The, the GATT, uh, sorry, the WTO and its predecessor, the, the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, uh, have been the cornerstone of multilateral uh, trade cooperation for the last 75 years. And one of the key functions of the, of the WTO has been to help nations resolve trade disputes in a rule-based way. I mean, that, there are ways to solve trade disputes that um, don't follow the rules. We're kind of seeing how that works, uh, where, where it's just brute force, nations throwing their weight around and engaging in tariff retaliation and trade wars. Um, and this is a problem because the, GATT, the WTO has success, successfully solved in a rules-based way over 500 trade disputes since, 19, uh, since 1995. And, um, and now, however, it is in crisis, and this is in, 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 endangering the, um, the future of the organization. So tonight, we are fortunate to have Petros Mavroidis, uh, a leading expert of um, the WTO, a leading legal expert on the WTO. Uh, and he's gonna evaluate the crisis and provide some practical proposals for trade dispute adjudication going forward. Um, Professor Mavroidis is Edwin B. Parker, Professor of Foreign and Comparative Law at Columbia Law School. He has served as a member of the WTO Legal Affairs Division uh, from 1992 to 1995, and he's been a legal, legal advisor to the WTO since 1996. He's written 10 books and scores of articles and book chapters on, um, on the regulation of, and, and, and the law of international trade. His latest book with Andre uh, Sapir is titled China and the WTO, Why Multilateralism Still Matters. Uh, I'm reading it right now. It's fantastic. He was kind enough to send me an inscribed copy, and I've been devouring it. We can hopefully get a chance to talk about some of the issues um, that are raised in the book, but it's just out from uh, Princeton University Press 2021. Um, he tells me, Petra says he's got another book coming out next year on dispute settlement. Um, and, and that I'm eagerly looking forward to seeing as well. In 2017, he won the Certificate of Merit in International Law for the distinguished contributions in the field of exec, uh, from, to the field from the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law. Um, he is a member of the Center on Global Governance, Governance and serves on boards of advisors for the Columbia Journal of International Law and the Columbia Journal of e European Law. He has many affiliations. He's a member of the American Law Institute, the American Arbitration Association, and the Swiss Institute of Comparative Law. Um, before we get started, I want to give you the, uh, an idea of the format of today's event. Uh, Petrus is going to do about a 30-minute presentation, which will be followed by a Q&A that will be moderated by our own Nikki uh, Jazayiri, who is a master's student at uh, the G School of Global Policy and Strategy here at UC San Diego. Um, if you wanna enter questions, you can do so at any time, but uh, we won't get to them until after Petrus's presentation and Nikki will curate those questions. Um, okay, without further ado, let me turn it over to Petrus. Looking forward to your, your insights. Okay, thank you very much, Lawrence. This was uh, much more than I deserve. Um, I'm very happy to be here and I'm always happy to be associated with Lawrence and Mark Andreas Mindler at San Diego. So this is what I will speak about. I'll speak about the crisis of WTO dispute adjudication. I'll try to explain why in my view, this is not self-contained. Why I'll ask, it cannot be explained easily through what has been through what has transpired in terms of critique of the regime. 
And why, in my view, although we have imperfect information about the future, it's hard to see it resolved anytime soon. Because I tend to believe that unless the US has resolved its issues with China, the waning of WTO adjudication will go on. It's not, uh, it's more of a doom and gloom type of discussion rather than anything else. So I start with the quip, which I love. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, one of my heroes, a polymath in the uh, American Revolution, he's um, discussing the Constitutional Convention. And uh, during a break, as he walks out, he meets uh, an advisor to General Washington who says, what kind of regime are you bequeathing the American society? And he says, well, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. And <laughs> unfortunately, by now, we know that the successors to the WTO framers could not keep the republic that they were bequeathed with back in 1995. So I'll do four things. First, I'll explain why the DSU matters, in my view, of course. Second, how it has fared so far, both quantitative and a little bit of qualitative judgment. Then I'll describe what we have learned from the current stalemate, which in my view is not much. And I'll spend the best part of my discussion on what is to nix, in my view, of course, and what is to fix in the WTO dispute settlement. Now, the brush tracks of the DSU, the mechanics are straightforward. It's a two-phase regime, consultations between litigating parties, followed by uh, adjudication, which is two instance. First instance, panels. Second instance, the appellate body of a WTO. But what matters much more is the nature. This is a self-enforcing contract. I mean, there's nothing like an ex officio complaint. Members litigate against members. But the key point is there's no self-help. There is no gumbo diplomacy. This is a regime of compulsory third-party adjudication. So all disputes have to be resolved peacefully by a judge. Moreover, this is an exclusive forum. There is an imposs legal impossibility to submit the disputes elsewhere. Now, why it matters? Well, in my view, for two reasons. The first is obvious. If we have no enforcement, WTO is a forum where we conclude agreements. If agreements are not enforced, then why sign them in the first place? But equally importantly, or importantly anyway, this is the only comprehensive regime we have in international relations of compulsory third party adjudication. I mean, look around you and you see how many disputes are being resolved in other areas of international relations. And I'm afraid that uh, if this unique feature wanes, well, it might provoke negative spillovers in other areas of international relations as well. Now, we know it has waned so far, but before we move into this, let's see how it has fared all those years. So I go back to 1994 and I ask myself, what were in a nutshell the key expectations? Why did we do the DSU the way we did it? In the mind of many, and especially I think the US delegation, and in this respect, I sympathize a lot with the US, we went, the GATT fared very well. Bob Hudek has a fantastic book explaining the GATT dispute settlement in practice. But then in the last years, there was, if you wish, a change in the course of action. That's when some very sensitive disputes were submitted to the GATT. Farm disputes, the majority. US won six, seven times, hands down. And Europe six, seven times says, I'm sorry, I don't agree with the report. I'm blocking the report. Now, blocking might sound innocent or half innocent, but it means there is no legal value. So you play by the rules, you go to disputes, you win cases, and then surprise, surprise, lo and behold, your win means nothing. So there was a need to move away from the possibility of the respondent, the losing party, to block adoption of reports. And over the, especially in the last years, now there are a number of studies, also by the WTO, I have to say, very good studies, actually, by the WTO, 
which saw the timeline of disputes, disputes were dragging along. So the US, who was the undisputed hegemon in the 80s when the Uruguay round is being negotiated, insisted on these two points. First, avoid the unpleasant experience of the last God days. And second, come up with something which would be akin to fast relief. We shouldn't wait forever to have disputes. Now, did the, w, did the DSU deliver? If this is the premise, why we have a DSU? Well, it depends how you see things, of course. I'm, uh, Henrik Horn, who is my, one of my permanent co-authors uh, uh, and somebody from who I learned a lot about dispute settlement, and myself, we have put together a data set, which now we update and expand with Mark Andreas, Professor Dr. Mark Andreas Mindler and Lawrence Bros. So what does the data set say roughly? Between 95 and 2019, there are 24 disputes on average per year. Now, the number as such doesn't say much because we don't know what is the ideal or optimal number of disputes. Actually, we don't even know when disputes arise to start with. But if you compare the number of disputes with, you come up with a reasonable, let's say, comparison, WTO with ICJ, it's a multiplier. International Court of Justice does all sorts of international law and it's more or less around two, two point something disputes a year. WTO was 24 disputes a year and they're both state to state forms. In the last two years, the total is 10 disputes, but the last two years suffer from what I'll explain later, the absence of appellate body and the risk of appealing to the void. So the system has been used relatively frequently, if the benchmark for frequency is other state-to-state -state forms. Unilateralism has been constrained. There are maybe one or one and a half cases of uh, where a member took justice into its own hands. WTO members routinely submitted disputes to the WTO. Compliance record, here I take a little bit of distance from a number of people who look into the same picture. In my view, it's hard to assess unless if we make some conventions. Why? Because it de depends on how we define compliance. If I implement a report, sorry, does the rationale, the reason why I implement a report matter? If it doesn't matter, well, the compliance looks excellent. But if it does matter, if I don't implement a report because US promised it will vote for me to have a, a seat in the Security Council, for example, then, uh, then it's a different story. And we don't know actually why compliance has occurred because very often this is a question of private information and we are uh, full steam ahead in a prisoner's dilemma type of situation here. But if we make some reasonable assumptions and if we discard the rationale, then Compliance record looks satisfactory, to say the least. I, I have disaggregated data, if you wish, we can discuss about it later. And not only this, now we have a dispute adjudication regime which is maribond by any reasonable account, but still we don't observe form diversion. What I observe is uh, PTAs, preferential trade agreements proliferate, but they don't adjudicate or they don't adjudicate much. Disputes still, either they're submitted nowhere or still go to the WTO at the risk of an appeal into the void, which I'll describe in a second. So when I look into the record, I make a distinction between institutional stakeholders and academia. Matteo Fiorini is an Italian econometrician and four or five people, we work together with Matteo, we ran a survey we asked a number of stakeholders about their views uh, concerning the performance of panels in the appellate, appellate body. I would say overall, we came up with uh, satisfactory responses. They were more or less happy. They were not unhappy with the quality of the judgments and timeliness and so on and so forth. There were grievances and we'll discuss in a moment, but overall, more or less happy. Academia, I would say it had less laudatory. And before I explain here why I make this statement, 
I have to say there's only one systematic peer review of the case law of the appellate body. Henry Horn had this idea 20 years ago to put together a group of people, economists and lawyers who write joint reports about each and every report that comes out from the WTO adjudicating bodies. Now, uh, in respect, these were people from all walks of life. I mean, we, Henry Kessen did not want to keep it to people like him and myself, we think more or less alike now, but bring people with different understanding of the WTO and different outlook. Systematically, all those guys were complaining about the methodology that the adjudicators have utilized in order to resolve disputes. And I think this is probably the reason why you see a difference between the evaluation by stakeholders and by academia. Stakeholders care about the outcome. Did they complain us, ask one question, has compliance been achieved? Who cares about the way it's been achieved? But the means don't matter very much. But for academia, they do because they see the role of the judge as the agent who will complete an otherwise incomplete contract. And the completion in one case provides the information for the completion in the marginal transaction. So this is where a number of reports in the view of this group, which I repeat is, does not suffer from sample bias when it comes to academic opinions, uh, they have uh, not performed as well as we might have wanted them to perform. But both stakeholders and academia, they agree on one thing, irrespective of uh, the record of compliance, if it is well, what matters is the process. And that's something that Andres Shapir consistently insisted. The process matters. We have established now a body or in a, in a particular realm of international relations and trade, we resolve disputes in a different way. We don't, we have forgotten about gambo diplomacy. And that's in and of itself quite important. Now against this background, we are where we are. There is no appellate body. And of course, if there is no appellate body, you ask yourself the question, why should I submit to a panel? Because I submit to a panel, I win. And then guess what? <laughs> the other party appeals into the void and there is no resolution of the dispute. Now the proximate cause, I think it's clear. It was the boycott by the Trump administration. They refused to appoint appellate body judges whose mandate had been terminated. But when I put my head down and I try to understand the ultimate cause, quite frankly, I have a very hard time to come up with something persuasive. Because in my view, the Trump administration was more anti-WTO, not necessarily anti-DSU. And the DSU was the collateral damage. Uh, it is the attitude towards trade that prompted this action and not the attitude against bad judgments. I'll give you some examples in a moment. And this is where I see a difference with the Obama administration, for example, which was hostile to one particular judge, but did not stop the process in the name of one particular judge. So in my view, we cannot learn much from the US, as we say in French, cahier de doléances, the list of grievances. We cannot learn much that would help us resolve the crisis. So this is the cahier de doléances. When I look into the US list of grievances, some are very meritorious. I mean, with Andrea, we have published a book essentially arguing that the appellate body does not make any sense when they interpret public body the way they do, especially the first judgments. Some are innocuous, distinguished issues. Yes, okay, they, you can make, I agree with the US. They, it was an error, but this is not the make or break of the system. Some are hard to understand. I mean, how can the US disapprove of precedent? I mean, the whole US legal system is geared towards precedent. How can we tell the appellate body or the panels don't look into the past? It's one thing to say precedent. It's a different thing to say, I have to never, ever, ever put into question precedent. And of course, you, you, can, you might agree and disagree, but you have to explain. That's the logic of precedent. You can agree, you can disagree, but you cannot overlook. Anyway, and there are, I was not just surprised, but bewildered when the US did not complain more about, for example, US tuna. This is one, I can give you other examples, which we can do during the Q&A, where I thought that you should have won hands down and they lost a couple of cases for absolutely no reason. 
and there are complaints about this of institutional dimension as well, fine. But the question I ask is, is this enough to throw away and the baby and the bath water? I mean, it, are, is this enough to say no more adjudication in the WTO? Because you see, I don't think that the US is complaining about bias. Bias means I consistently find against a particular source. But when we look into disputes with Henrik and with Bernard, who had the paper, and I know Lawrence has a paper on exactly the same issue, and without speaking to each other, we both adopted the same uh, definition of win, of victory before the WTO. Percentage-wise, the, the US wins as much as anyone. So what the US is complaining about, actually, is noisy judgment this inconsistent decision-making by the appellate body special, which increases uncertainty about transaction costs. But noisy judgments must have to do with the kind of people we ask to adjudicate disputes. This is not bias. Let's do a better job. Let's put the A team over there, and maybe we'll have a different, or let's write more complete contracts if we can. There are ways to fix it. You don't have to mix it right away. Now, Having said that, when you look into the previous slide, the uh, US uh, here, the US Cahier de Doléance, when with Fiorini we asked the question, what's going on, how many people agree, disagree, we found many people who disagreed with particular aspects of the US, uh, of the US critique, but no one who was willing to follow the US attitude and nix the dispute, the appellate body. The membership was keen to keep compulsory third party adjudication. And thank God the membership did not pull the plug because the last thing I would like to see is a WTO myself without uh, uh, the US. So let's keep this and we'll come back into it in a moment. So the question I want to ask is, is the US ready to come back and talk? A DSU resolution, a WTO resolution or ideally both. But before I do this, let me say just one, this is very brief. Here, I want to ask the question, well, why didn't we respond to this crisis? There is no insurance po endogenous insurance policy in the DSU. Now, remember, the promise was adjudicate only through the procedures embedded in the DSU. You can do nothing else. Now, what is, how have members, the members, how, how has the membership reacted to the stalemate? I've seen three, and that's thanks to our work with Lawrence and our excellent research assistant, Dr. Rohan Rohan, uh, who pointed the third of, I knew two, and he pointed out the third uh, means to resolve um, the crisis. What is the problem here? Appeal into the void. I win a case against Lawrence. Lawrence says I appeal. Well, but there is no appellate body. Hence, my win is Peric victory. I won nothing. How do we avoid the appeal into the void? There are three ways. One is in practice, ad hoc agreements. Lawrence and me sign an agreement and say, we forego the appellate review. Whatever the panel decides, it's the last word. Based on this, we see what needs to be done. Fine. The second that Rohan unearthed was Article 25. There are a couple of cases where Rohan, uh, Lawrence and myself, we say, OK, there is no appellate body, but we'll use the Article 25 numbers are an important arbitration procedure, which exists as substitute for appellate review. Fine again. And the third one is the so-called multi-party interim agreement and EU initiative. Now, number one ad hoc agreements, two cases. Number two, two cases. Number three, no cases. But there is a worse. Number one and two, observe the DSU. We're not going outside the four corners of the DSU when we make an agreement about foregoing appellate review or uh, using arbitration. But MPIA, it's something which is not in the DSU. I personally have strong doubts to what extent MPIA is consistent with the DSU. I think you can make a very good argument that is inconsistent. Article 23.2 is clear, all disputes must go to the DSU. MPIA is not a DSU. So only took four cases in total and appeals into the void keep increasing. My latest count was close to 20. 
So what have I said so far? Crisis has led to adjudication paralysis provoked by the anti-WTO attitude, no insurance policy. So the question I'd like to spend the last five, seven minutes is, where do we go from here? Now, first of all, I, I, I just want to explain the limits of the last part of my talk. I don't think that solving the judiciary crisis is uh, the end of the story because um, um, unless if we solve the legislative crisis, the WTO eventually will continue to be in crisis. How long, that's my self-telling question, how long can the WTO adjudicate disputes from agreements of the 1990s? Because that's since 1995, only one agreement has been signed, agreement on trade facilitation. And when you look at the context of FTAs, and my very dear friend Michele Ruta was one of the leaders in a World Bank study, which is an excellent survey of where we stand in terms of content of FTAs, FTAs run away with the, with the policy game. I mean, they have all the legislation takes place in FTAs. I would expect eventually, if things don't change, that they will also develop meaningful adjudication regimes. But having said that, judiciary, solving the judiciary is, in my view, the necessary first step. So, and I think it should be a priority, but uh, because the legislative activity has migrated anyway. Now, how do we solve the, 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 the judicial crisis? I mean, I don't think there is something like a magic bullet here, but there's one thing I wanted to draw everybody's attention to. The WTO judge, and this is not, uh, I mean, it's nothing I put here in, it's an understatement, maybe not in an enviable position, but think about what the WTO judge does. He or she has in front of him or her a super incomplete contract, the WTO, title, national treatment, uh, illegal obligation, do not discriminate. What on earth does not discriminate me? Which they must interpret through another incomplete contract the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I mean, this, you cannot appoint anyone, any dictum and hire it to be. This, you have to bring your A team here to adjudicate this. These are difficult, difficult intellectual issues. Now, I can show you a number, I mean, we can discuss it later, a number of examples where on basic and basic obligations where I think the appellate body case law leaves a lot to be desired. What is non-discrimination? What is benefit of a subsidy passed through? I've seen black, white, and gray. What can state trading enterprises do and not do? But most importantly, what bothers me is I haven't seen one case, one case so far where the appellate body said, non liquet law is unclear, I cannot pronounce, the ball should go back to the legislator's camp. So they are in a difficult position and they want to have a license to adjudicate everything, even when legitimately, one might wonder to what extent law is clear enough for them to adjudicate. That's me a recipe for whatever happened later. My two cents. First and then the last point why I don't see my two cents ever being uh, the currency in the WTO. I mean, if I were, it won't happen, but if I had carte blanche, I would say, well, what is the best way to come up with something reasonable and feasible? I would go by revealed preferences. And I checked a little bit, not a little bit, I checked for some time now, a number of FTAs done between different hubs and different spokes. I put here a couple of examples, but I've checked much more. So what do these FTAs have in common when it comes to adjudicating disputes? One, they have compulsory third party adjudication. Two, one instance, not two instance adjudication. There is no necessity, there's absolutely no necessity to have an appellate body. If you care about uh, uh, coherence in case law, well, then you can have, for example, it's panels that will be adjudicating disputes, but part of the panels should be the same people. That's exactly what they do in TPP. They have chairs actually of any nationality, which are more or less a cohesive group, and then you can appoint uh, whoever you want to appoint as a judge. So, I would add the screening process because I don't want to see in the WTO again the kind of people I've seen in the past. And I'm, I insist on this point. I would like every WTO judge 
to have his or her own law clerk. You cannot be the secretariat of the WTO, serve God and Mammon, you serve and the WTO secretariat and the judges. These things don't work. I would like judges to have their own law clerks as they do in all federal courts in the US. My two more cents is, um, remember that resolving the judiciary crisis only is like rearranging the furniture on the deck of the Titanic. Eventually we have to address the legislative crisis. But this should be an independent discussion. I mean, irrespective of what will be the nature of integration in the WTO, enforcement of even shallow integration is a prerequisite for everything else to follow. Is there any urgency? Well, I see the opposite. I see ominous bellwethers, and with these two slides, I'll stop. I've been following the Biden administration. Like many people in this country, I was expecting radical change. I was proved wrong once again. Uh, they've been now in power for close to one year. And what have I seen? She insists on China delivering on phase one. Arguably, there is a paper by Chad Baum China has not delivered on phase one, but phase one is totally anti-WTO. It's managed straight from beginning to the end. Gary Huffbauer of the same institute is a fantastic paper on this. I haven't seen any functional proposal from the USTR on what do we do with the WTO. And I think that I would urge the USTR to think of the opportunity cost of its non-decisions here. And in my view, unless the US and the USDR delink the crisis of judiciary from everything else WTO, I, I fear there will be no so easy or fast solution for dispute adjudication. Let's leave the bigger question to see this up for later. Why am I pessimistic? Because I see the ambassador Tai recently doing the exact opposite of what I thought would be the optimal course of action. Actually, she refuses to delink the judiciary crisis from the wider WTO crisis. Um, is the view of the WTO, I don't know, it's a question that the WTO, which is the product of a US-EU negotiation, large, works for the benefit of China, which did not participate in the process of building the WTO. Uh, I don't know, because Ambassador Tai keeps repeating WTO 2.0, so she's unhappy with what she sees, which they put together with Europe, I repeat before taking the steps to address the crisis of the judiciary. And I see, unfortunately, that the turn to manage trade is gaining pace. It's not just phase one. A couple of days ago, I got this joint communique between Europe and the US on uh, steel. And again, this has managed trade written all over it. Of course, Europe on the one hand does those things, on the other is member of MPIA. I don't know where they are in international trade, quite frankly. And this is why I'm quite optimistic about a short-term solution. Thank you very much. And one last thing for my dear friend, Lawrence, you stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> oh, Patrice, I'm sorry we couldn't bring you out here to go see the, pan <laughs> to see the, see the pandas at the zoo. <laughs> oh, that was great. Uh, lots to think about. Um, at this point, I want to turn the floor over to Nikki Jaziri who is a master's student here at GPS. Um, she's really great. She studies international economics in Latin America. She's currently working as a teaching assistant in a course called Microeconomics for Policymakers. That should be required of all policymakers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's also active in student government, which gives you a sense of her, her wide um, energy and, and enthusiasm. She's um, the vice president of internal affairs for Women Going Global a student organization, as well as the main student. She's a VP of finance on the student organization at GPS called Go GPS. So Nikki, I'm gonna let you ask the first question and then you can start drawing from the q and I see a few questions there already. Yeah, thank you so much for the um, great introduction. Can everyone see and hear me? Okay, cool. And thank you so much, Petros, for the really informative and interesting um, little speech. I was taking a lot of really good notes. I had a question for you to start us off about China. I know um, a lot of WTO members have recently been expressing a lot of frustration with China's like special differential treatments, you know, since it joined 20 years ago. 
Um, however, China does not seem to want to be giving up these benefits that it's receiving. How plausible do you think any sort of change is in the near future in this kind of treatment? I mean, um, I, I, I cannot speak about Chinese politics in the future, but I can tell you how plausible I think this uh, complaint is. Um, um, and this is, uh, this is exactly what we did with Andre. In my view, in our view, actually, um, China, we don't have much time, so it'll be schematic. China, if it violates something, this is more the spirit, not the letter of the WTO. Uh, every time China lost a dispute, there is discussion about one case. Maybe they didn't implement, but they implemented everything else. I mean, they, behave, they don't behave worse than other players when it comes to implementing adverse rulings. Now, uh, the, the, the problem that I see is that the negotiators of the euro go around follow the opposite strategy of the negotiators, the US negotiators of TPP. In TPP, they negotiated the regime for China without China. In WTO, they did not. If you look at the subsidies agreement, which is negotiated at the same time when there is a working group on China, even the term SOE is missing. To, to, to adjudicate SOEs, appellate body, plan panels, they had to link it to public bodies. Even the terms miss. So uh, I'm not very happy with the case law on public bodies. I think the US was absolutely right when it made the points on ownership. But this doesn't mean that uh, this is not, I cannot blame China for the mistakes of the appellate body. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the Q&A now. We have a question from Renee. Um, she says, the idea of a self-enforcing agreement, or at least in game theory, is predicated on mutual gains from cooperation, um, not direct conflict or zero-sum. Uh, but the case of agriculture and steel appear to be zero-sum. Why should we expect self-enforcement? Many disputes in other industries are resolved amicably. Um, these are industries where there was, where as a true the prisoner's dilemma structure, isn't the DSM set up for failure in the case of agriculture, steel, and other contentious industries? And she does want to say that she's not trying to have her question be interpreted as doom and gloom, um, quite the opposite. I didn't get the last part. Lawrence, because I cannot hear very well when uh, Nikki speaks. Can you repeat a little bit the last part? I didn't get the last part. You, you, can't, you don't come across very clear. I don't know when you speak. To me, I hear when I'm in New York. But Lawrence, I can hear 100%. Oh, OK, good. Let, yeah. let, me, let me give it yeah. a shot. Uh, question about the so Renee's question is about whether steel. these uh, agreements are self enforcing, particularly in certain industries like ag and steel. Yeah. Um, and the last part was there, the these were industries where there were there was a true prisoner's dilemma structure. Isn't the DM set up for failure in the case of agriculture, steel, and other contentious industries? And again, she doesn't mean this in a doom and gloom way about the future of the WTO. So you see, first of all, there's not, I mean, the steel would be, the majority of steel cases are either safeguards or anti-dumping or countervailing duties cases. That's, that's where you see the steel dispute. I haven't seen them anywhere else in the WTO. Uh, if, this, if these regimes work for every other industry, why not for steel as well? I understand that there is a problem. People talk about overcapacity and so on and so forth, but those things, overcapacity, exists in the last years, most likely driven by Chinese subsidies. Why don't you take those guys to the court and say, well, they subsidize, and this is why we ended up where we ended up, unless if they think the subsidies agreement is not perfect, but that's a totally different issue. Agriculture is, um, um, the agricultural disputes, quite frankly, I haven't seen much of a uh, acrimony concerning the outcomes in agriculture. Actually, the opposite is true in the, in the sense that the reports were went far. The number of uh, uh, instruments that looked like variable levies, one of the key targets of the negotiation, have been outlawed, and reports have been implemented. Uh, this is, you see, the majority of legitimate complaints concerning the case law in subsidies. Public bodies is the only issue which involves China. The rest is between EU and US. It's the Airbus Boeing cases. So what do you do with cases like this? I mean, how much, well, that's... Uh, um, 
my view was that this, this, this type of dispute should never go to the WTO. I don't see that there is who have an adequate institutional design to deal with those cases effectively. Uh, I cannot see how you can discuss uh, questions of international oligopoly without some basic economics expertise across panels, for example. Uh, but this again, I mean, this is uh, how we designed the system and how we practiced it. I cannot blame anyone else but those who put in place the WTO and the WTO infra and the infrastructure for WTO dispute adjudication. Okay, uh, shall we read the next question? Nikki, do you want to try again and see if it's more clear? Maybe your mic is improved. <laughs> yeah, I can try again. Um, so Minju Kim, a postdoc at CCD, wants to know, given that WTO member status have often relied on DSU as a way to resolve FTA-related disputes, do you think the adjudication paralysis in the WTO would ultimately undermine bilateralism? Undermines what? Bilateralism. Well, I mean, the whole idea of adjudication is to be multilateral, no? The whole idea of the WTO is to have multilateral adjudication, which would put into question bilateral solutions that have negative spillovers for the rest of the world, uh, if that's the question. Uh, any multilateral adjudication process, by definition, would put into question bilateral deals which have negative, don't respect MFN. What is wrong with that? Unless if I miss something in the question. Petrus, I think you can see the question to yourself if you click on click Q&A on your screen. Ah, perfect. OK, so the second question. Uh, this will be the third, Minju Kim. Yeah. Oh, no, given the government this year, where so FTA led disputes. Ah, okay, now I got it. So you see, that's a very interesting question. Sorry, he meant, uh, so his point is, I can take a dispute to an FTA or I can take it to the WTO. And when I take it to the WTO, do I put into question uh, uh, the sustainability of an FTA? You see, first of all, in general, we did the paper with Andre a few years ago. In general, FTA partners, they litigate much, much less than uh, non-FTA partners. The amount of litigation is considerably less. The only outlier in our account was the NAFTA at the time, now USMACA, where you had a number of disputes. Now, having said that, the WTO will never adjudicate a dispute, cannot adjudicate a dispute using the FTA text. It will use the WTO text. So. To the extent that the FTA text copies the WTO text, then you can ask the question, well, does it matter? I mean, you, if you go WTO, it's one and the same. But if there is a WTO extra WTO plus element, the WTO adjudicating bodies have to ignore it. They cannot take it on board. So the, rational, the reason why you do an FTA and whether it might give rise to disputes can never be a question before a WTO panel. So in this sense, I don't think this is correct, that it undermines bilateralism. Next question, Mark Mindler. I can read it. You know, the administration might be willing to assume the blockade. It likely matters how compliance was achieved before. If regardless of AB, compliance used to de depend on exerting additional pressure of offering WTO on it, and then there is less consequential, eventually, yeah, that was, then it seems from a purely legal perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I never understood why, first of all, the Apple of Bud, if we go back to the history, it was not something that people were striving at. It was not the main, the centerpiece of the negotiation. Actually, I was looking about it for um, our discussions with um, Mark and, uh, and uh, Lawrence, and I found six references to the Apple of Bud, during the negotiations, at the end of the, it was definitely an afterthought. Mm. And uh, first and second, one of the, the, the head of the DSU negotiating party, the, the working party, Lacarte, Julio Lacarte Miro, he went public stating that the expectation was that the appellate body would be implicated every now and then, infrequently, if need be, on a need to know something basis. 
so everybody was surprised when in the first years, almost 50% of the panels, panel reports were appealed. And in the later years, over 70%. So it was not something that people were, I, quite frankly, if I were the WTO, uh, if I had the power to decide what would be WTO DSU 2.0, I would say, forget the apple at body. The apple at body has not, in my view, provided uh, the service that some, the proponents thought it would. Moreover, it is a, a delaying factor because uh, you delay the whole process by a long time. And not only this, because in the WTO have prospective remedies, you have to wait four or five years before you are, you see uh, justice done on your, on your side if you win, which you can cut it by half if you drop the apple at body. Uh, as I said, in my view, it has not, it has not uh, provided the legal certainty that people claim it has. So I'd like to ask a question about this uh, clarification. So if we, if we propose dropping the appellate body, does that mean going back to uh, the GATT uh, adjudication uh, settlement system where the problem of, uh, you know, respondents blocking panels meant that enforcement was weak where it mattered. Not necessarily. We can go back to the GATT with compulsory third party adjudication and where we accept that negative consensus. We have one instance court. And if the, we have what we have uh, uh, in the WTO without the appellate body, if I win and I like the report, the report is adopted. Unless if we all dislike yeah. it, only then it will not be adopted. Right. That never happens. Never. I mean, I, I, well, there's one case where it sort of happened, there was not, didn't happen. There was one case in the gut years where the parties agreed that the report was wrong. But once in all the history yeah. of GAT yeah. WTO. Yeah, it's, I'm not, I, I like the idea, certainly for uh, more expediency, well, quicken things up. And that's one of the complaints of the United States. But I'm not sure it solves the problem about rulings that powerful governments don't like. And if now they're just coming earlier and we get a bunch of uh, panel reports condemning US you know, um, anti-dumping procedures, uh, isn't that simply gonna make the United States dissatisfied with the new WTO 2.0? Yeah, I mean, there, this is about the, the broader question of national sovereignty and how much of it countries are today willing to cede I, I have two responses because I did not do justice to Reni. I was reading now her question after we mm. spoke. So what Reni says actually is what some people have written and they said, why don't we have a carve out for contingent protection outside the, let's keep it outside the WTO, for example. Now, you see, let's assume this is the case. So I take a case against the US and I argue the case under article six of GATT, not under the anti-dumping agreement. How can you stop it? Would you have a carve out also for half of the gap? Yeah. You know, so to me, this argument doesn't hold because six is anti-dumping, 16 is subsidies and 19 is safeguards. Okay, we'll take the agreements out, the three agreements, but I can still take you to court based using the gap. But the second point that I wanted to say is that the concern that people have is largely, in my view, a self-inflicted damage. And let me explain what I say here. One of the most contentious negotiating issues was this idea of permissible interpretations in anti-dumping, where the US insisted on including this term as a specific standard of review. And I will preface my response and I will explain it in a moment. I think the US has a very good point here. Now, what is the, and I'm not a friend of anti-dumping, as you know, from my publications, not at all, actually. But the US, it's one thing what I think about anti-dumping, it's a different thing what I would do as a judge. As a judge, I'm an agent, I'm not a principal. I have to apply the law that people decide. Now the US introduces these words, permissible interpretation, as a standard specific for anti-dumping, which of course should be different from the generic standard. Otherwise, why introduce those words? From the first case to the last case, the appellate body refused to see any special meaning in this term. Now, here, and this is what I think in part prompts 
the problematic cases point that are any made. Here, the US says, wait a second here. I spent negotiating capital trying to, how do you know what I had to give up in order to have these words in the anti-dumping agreement? Who are you judged to say these words mean nothing or they mean the same thing as the generic standard from which I wanted to deviate in the first place? So if at all the presumption should be in favor of the US, I have a standard in 17.6 because they don't like the generic standard. But this is self-inflicted damage. I mean, we should not be discussing those things if you had three competent judges that say, stop, let's take one step, step back. Let's visit the negotiating record properly. And if we still cannot agree, that's a classic case of non get. Throw the ball back to the negotiators. Say, I'm sorry, I don't understand. I have one standard objective assessment and another standard dumping. I don't understand what is the difference for whatever reason, you resolve it. But I will not find that somebody is wrong based on incomplete information concerning where the law is. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, I'll read it, Nikki, since I think my mic is working a little better. I agree that solving judiciary problem is the first step at the WTO. MC12 has been a focus has been has to be focused on legislative issues since the US refused to discuss judiciary before the next year. Can you can any agreement be done in legislative areas in the MC12? And what do you think will define MC12 success? Uh, I I'm not an insider. I get information. Uh, from uh, different sources. I don't see much optimism, quite frankly, and uh, the agreements which are the JSI's joint statement initiatives likelier to conclude, I would call them innocuous and innocent. I mean, if you look at the discussion on good practices in uh, good regulatory practices and services, it's, it's an empty shell. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about MC12. What would define success in MC12? In my view, the best outcome would not be an agreement, but would be a commitment by what Zelly called the responsible stakeholders to sit down and resolve the crisis. That would be to me a strong signal that the WTO and multilateralism matters. There's another question which says, what would I prioritize? Again, by Dr. Bowen. To me, what I would prioritize at this stage would be dispute adjudication. Uh, the WTO, the difference between WTO and UNCTAD is precisely this. We have agreements which we should be enforcing. And this is why I'm a little bit disappointed in Ambassador Tai, uh, although I placed a lot of hope in the change of administration in the US personally. I was hoping that uh, uh, I had no illusions. I'm not expecting to see uh, a 1946 uh, redux. Let's rebuild the international economy, liberal international economic order. We're not there yet. And it's a different circumstance. At the time, there was one hegemon. Now it has to be multipolar. But I was expecting more positive steps towards rebuilding the WTO, and I haven't seen them. And I cannot see how uh, labor standards and all the things she has explained in the last weeks are a priority over a dysfunctioning dispute settlement quite frankly. We have a WTO which cannot enforce its agreements, and we want to add agreements, which it will, of course, not enforce as long as we don't resolve the judiciary crisis. A lot seems to be riding on uh, getting an agreement on fishing subsidies uh, as a, a, a win, maybe a small win, but something that gives some legitimacy to the WTO. Yeah, but I mean, uh, honestly, um, Honestly, what kind of a victory is that? I mean, if you have another agreement which will remain unenforced because dispute settlement doesn't work, and uh, uh, first of all, let's see if there is an agreement on fisheries because there's a lot of discussion, and I keep hearing all sorts of views about to what extent they're close or not close to an agreement. Yeah. There is another question now, which I read, it says, if this U was reformed, so there's no EAB. Do you think expert panelists sustain member support that this year would be best achieved by having a rotating sending panelists? Yeah, I mean, you know, I am I am not a huge fan of um, of uh, ad hoc panelists. I like to have some sort of like 15, 20, the, the, the chair, the chair system in TPP. 
let's agree. That's why I say let's agree on threshold criteria. Threshold criteria. Let's not appoint every Dick Top and Tom and Harry in the upload. But these are very intellectually very tough questions. I mean, how do you define protection? Protection is an information problem. This is the key, the core question of the WTO. I can show you disputes. You read the out, you say, my, my God, I mean, where is the protection here? But people lost. How does the US administration feel after US tuna? To me, this is the outcome only of incompetence, nothing else. So I would rather, and because, uh, I mean, okay, uh, information and talent is dis distributed equitably, but there are not 20,000 international trade experts we can pick from. Let's find the 15, 20, 25 top people and ask them to be there. And then, yes, rotate between those 20, 25 people who will be accountable, who will have their own clerks, and they will be signing their decisions. I don't like, you know, I tried to do typecasting and I stopped. Uh, I, you know, I'll explain both of panelists with uh, a Swedish econometrician, Liz Johansson, a student of Henrik's. We stopped after the first, I don't remember, 50, 60 panels because we could find no information about these people, or even on the internet. We don't know where the, who they are, the panelists. You see people coming from everywhere suddenly and they discuss disputes of 60, 70, or sometimes $200 million. I mean, wait a second. Non-roster cons consistently, that is people that have not been approved by the membership with, uh, I don't know, first appointment in Geneva or from dubious place, crazy. Mm. So you, you've spoken about the, the quality problem of the panelists. Um, what about the process of uh, tying them to panels? Should that be randomized like appellate body um, members are chosen? I, I, first, I, I would not have appellate bodies, I told you. I would have one, right. I would have 25 people maximum who would be the permanent panelists. Give right. them a fixed mandate, eight years, no renewal, so they don't have to signal, I'm a good guy, keep me here forever. Uh, one mandate, eight years, and let's make sure these are people that we agree upon, that these are people that would, you know, the older people, I don't belong to them, but uh, say when I speak <laughs> to older people, um, they point to instances like Bob Hudek, one of my heroes, who unfortunately is not one from whom I've learned a lot, uh, writing the report on US custom user fee that Bob is an American professor in Minnesota, previously at Yale, and he writes a report and he finds against the US. And nobody, no eyebrow is raised. This was, this, I can, I cite in my book for next year, a number of cases like this. What happened to appointing this type of people to WTO panels? Why has, I mean, trade was always, well, not part of the administrative state, was always part of the political game. But why could we accept this type of people to adjudicate disputes 30 years back and we cannot do it any, anymore. You read GATT reports, GATT panel reports. I'm not saying they're all good. There are many GATT panel reports. I mean, TUNA, the first TUNA report. I could never, I don't understand one word there. How, again, how did the US lose? Only the people who wrote the report know. But there were some dimes, some jewels. In there. I don't see those jewels. I see consistently a verbose attitude, 5,000 pages. They contradict the, uh, some paragraphs, previous paragraphs, they cite uh, the, the submissions 5,000 times over and you get lost in the translation consistently. We must be doing something wrong, I don't know. There's another question. How often appellate body rulings meaningfully change the panel? The panel rulings. If there had been panel past three years, as panel regime, would outcomes have been any different? Would there be most, less noise or more noise? I don't know. I mean, it's very difficult to construct the counterfactual, but I can respond to the first question. Uh, I don't know what meaningful change means, but if by meaningful change we mean how often the outcome has changed, uh, it is less than 18%. If you talk about modifying the reasoning, it goes close to 40%. One more question, Petros. There's two to choose from, one from Michaela Ruta, one from Andrew Kennedy. Petros, who would it mean for, I will do both very quickly, for the WTF China joint CPTPP. 
And that, you know, that would be that would be the supreme irony. But what I hear, what I hear is uh, that uh, the U.S. is not uh, is willing to invoke 3210 of NAFTA. It's the, the article which says that if any of the NAFTA uh, USMACA partners uh, is uh, uh, willing to deal with China because they consider now China a non-market economy, they will pull out of NAFTA. So I don't think there is a strong likelihood this will happen. The last question is, if you were to build a WTO panel into other countries, how would you go about it? Uh, I, mean, I don't know much about the UNFCC. I, I, I think that as, uh, my default position is always to look for, uh, to ask this type of questions to people who know the regime very well. And I, I'm ignorant about, you know, a few things about the UNFCC, not enough to tell you uh, about how it should look like. I can only speak to some extent even about the WTO, and I'm sorry I cannot respond to this question. We have to close. I want to thank Petros for a, a wonderful talk, very insightful, and your responsiveness to the questions is great. Well, so many topics that we have not covered. Um, apologies for the short session to everybody, but hopefully you'll stay tuned and in the meantime, read uh, Petros's latest work. Uh, I particularly encourage you to get a hold of his book on China with, um, um, with this uh, cautious optimism about the multilateral forum being the place to address things like state-owned enterprises and subsidies and uh, technology force technology transfer. Okay, so thank you all for coming. I, I should have mentioned at the beginning um, our incredible staff. Let me close with that. This event would not have been uh, possible and certainly nowhere near as professional without the support of our project director, Fabian Perlov, without Semen Zhang, who's organized all the tech and, and uh, most of the uh, communications, and Amy Robinson, who handles all our, all our press and publications. So thank you all for the team um, and thank you for your participation. Good night, everybody. <laughs>